Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sales Power in less than an hour. Today, we have with us Cameron Soresby. He is the CEO at Praxis, which is a startup that's helping driven young people become self-directed career builders without college. He's worn many hats at Praxis over the five plus years that he's worked there and after being a participant himself in the program's early days. Um, one of those hats was actually in-person sales, one of the tough, one of the toughest ways to sell. I mean, in, in my opinion, I don't know about you guys, but he's now the visionary for the future of Praxis, including how, to, how best to communicate the value of the program to prospective participants. So Cameron, What's appreciate up? you. <laughs> Appreciate you coming on today. If you could give us just a quick story of where you came from and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so how how I got to Praxis. So this is kind of ties into what we try to help young people do through the program. So I was in college myself and throughout high school and college, I was trying to, I was struggling with those all too common questions of like, what the heck do I want to do with my life? And what could I see myself doing professionally in, in particular? And that was something I really started struggling with in high school and you know, kept, kept going in college. And, and at some point my mindset shifted to, okay, I, I kind of acknowledged for myself, like college wasn't particularly valuable uh, as far as being prepared to to hit my career, um, you know, hit the ground running in my career. And I just told myself like, all right, like I'm, as far as classes go, I'm just here to get in and get out. My job is to, is to kind of collect as many valuable experiences as I can outside the classroom. And I just wanted to pursue things that were interesting to me. I wanted to stop asking, trying to answer the question of what am I going to do for my entire career and just be like, what's the most valuable thing I can do for the next three months, for the next six months. And at some point that led me to interning for the founder of Praxis before he started Praxis. And it was the year I was interning for him that he told me about the concept for Praxis. And it immediately resonated with me. I was like, all right, this is something I know I wanna be a part of, it's just, getting off the ground. They're not hiring full-time employees yet or anything. And I don't know if I would be valuable for the company either. So I, I tricked my way into the business by becoming a customer first. And I went through the program right after I graduated college myself. Um, it was pretty much, I used it as like a more entrepreneurial MBA. That's what I was kind of thinking at the time. And I got a lot of value out of the program itself. It really helped me become a stronger professional in my first job out of college. And, and I just got to know the team better, got to know the company better. And, you know, sure enough, soon after I completed the program, you know, Praxis, we were uh, growing a little bit in the early days and I was able to join the team full time after that. And, um, you know, really over the last five, six years, I've been kind of doing anything required to, to help Praxis grow. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it sounds like you're you're exactly where you're meant to be. Um, like you kind of found the program, but it kind of found you as well. And sure. I mean, now now you basically run it. You know. <laughs> yep. um, yeah. So so you did in person sales for Praxis at one point. Is that right? Yeah. So in the early days, we did a lot of. Uh, sponsoring at different, you know, homeschool conferences, student org conferences, like business clubs, et cetera. So the first, first 18 months or so I was at Praxis, I was probably doing, you know, one to two in-person events a month. And my job there was try to re try to recruit new participants who could be a good fit. Okay. So how, because that job never really ends. Like you could be a salesperson and do that, but you could also be the CEO and do that, like, especially at a startup. So what what was like one of the top one or two things that you learned from having to communicate with people, you know, in that way to try to promote the program? Um, and, and how has that sort of helped you moving forward? Yeah, I, 
I I agree with you guys. Like, I, compared to being on the phone with somebody or you know just dealing with an inbound lead who who's warm and wants to know more about the product, doing that in person, you know, like the the structure of these these events would be we'd probably have one or two presentations, speaking events at the conference, and then we'd be like tabling out in like the main area most of the time. So like it was not, it was very difficult to, and it's exhausting if, if you ever done like, you know, event marketing or event sales, like those days just feel long and grueling. That was, I feel like that was half the battle of just being able to, to figure out like how to spend your energy wisely. And it wasn't very valuable just to be like sitting at the table all day. And then as people come by, like the more time that goes on, like the more exhausted and draining and drained you are. And then like, nobody wants to talk to you if you're putting out those vibes, you know? Um, so what we would do is like, we would be there for probably a quarter of the day and we would build like our table presence around like when we're going to speak and then have some type of offer to be like, hey, come, come down to the Praxis table and stuff. Um, and really you just wanna be working with a captive audience as much as possible. And if you don't have that captive audience, um, I think it's, it's just less efficient. So that would be one thing just like, okay, whether it's because we have speaking engagements or you know, can we get some promotional marketing material out to the conference attendees ahead of time that actually get, you know, makes them aware of Praxis so that you're not just like talking to a teen who may be interested in the program or more likely like a lot of parents would come by and be like, what is this Praxis thing? Um, you, I got a lot of those reps in of just, you know, describing Praxis cold and it was really good practice. And that definitely helped me get better at sales overall. Um, but as far as in-person sales goes, I think the big difference is you just have to be able to connect with somebody on a personal level, like you have five to 10 seconds and it feels different than being on the phone with somebody in my experience. Like I'm just more comfortable on the phone. And I think, I think people have like a natural tendency to be a little bit more self-conscious if you're, if you're face to face with somebody and it's like a, essentially like a cold outreach. Um, so just getting those reps in was a big thing. Yeah, and the, I mean, the five to 10 seconds is true no matter what version of selling you're doing, right? That's, right, right. It must be even worse when you're right there and you can tell that they're either checked out or judging yeah. you or, you know, all the things that happen because you're the sleazy salesperson trying to take their money. <laughs> <laughs> like... Yep. I mean, you just, you quickly find out, you know, you can tell when someone's like really interested in, in your product or service and it's like, great, I get to let's jump right into it. But you know, nine times out of 10, you got to be able to connect with someone before even thinking about selling to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so... I mean, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like, to add to that something that I've been learning recently, that feels like it would be definitely true. If you're in person with someone is just your confidence level on the things that you're saying, like, like, I know this feature, we have it and it's awesome. And people talk about it all the time versus a different question. And you're like, I, yeah, like you have to like think about it. If you have any hesitancy at all, people sense that. And then they either lose a little bit of trust or they think something else is going on and they, you know, get a little nervous. And yeah, it's, it's like that times a hundred, if they can see you have a question in your head that passes by but yep. then you give them an answer like <laughs> yeah the nice the nice thing about being in person though is you can it's just so much easier to read somebody else's body language and it's so much easier to like using your own body language just to be able to like connect with somebody and just be more friendly and stuff and it's not like i'm a you know i'm trying to just hit you up on the phone and it's like you really have a second to like you can hang up on me on either time. Like, yeah, people can walk away in person, like in that tabling format, but more likely than not, you actually probably have more time to work with in an in-person setting like that. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of the benefits like that, but that makes sense. 
Yeah, think about it this way. I'd be more likely to just hang up on someone by pressing uh, the red button um, right. and to just walk away from someone that yeah, approaches with, me. Yeah, without saying anything. Then, yeah. then you're the awkward person. And exactly. Nobody wants, nobody wants to be quite that awkward. Yeah. There's times though, some some of the kiosks in the mall, but that's different. That's yeah, definitely Those, yeah. definitely never that's interested in that. So I kind of just <laughs> go away. So um, I have a question for you, Cameron. So I'm sure you answered this one many times before, but what would you say to someone who's coming close to their end of high school and their plan is just to go to college because that's the typical route most people take and they don't know what they want to do as their career? Yeah, I, I think the biggest trap that young people not only fall into, but are kind of pushed into um, by the people around them is just like trying to plan your life before you start living it. Um, so like, you know, people go to college with the idea of like, hey, I'm going to pick a major. And then that major directly, you know, connects to what I'm going to do, not just my first job out of college, but, you know, the next 10 to 15, you know, 20 years or so. And if you ask, you don't even have to like think college isn't necessary by like, if you talk to anybody that's gone to college, 90% of them, nothing they're doing professionally is related to what they specifically studied in school. And, and if you keep, you know, going down that, that line of thought, it's like, all right, like college actually does not really connect to what you do professionally, period. And I would tell somebody like, forget, for, like if you're coming out of high school, forget about if you should go to college or not eventually, just think about what could be the most valuable way to spend, you know, that first semester of time. And if you actually allow, if you give permission to yourself to, to think about alternative ways to spend that time, anybody can come up with like 10 to 15 other things to do instead and, and just try one. And if you want to go back to college, you know, in the future, you can, um, but more often than not, like if you're actually pursuing something you're interested and passionate about, you'll probably just find better ways to spend your time. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I personally tried to do a couple of semesters of school and I just, I just couldn't do it. I mean, some of those pre rec classes are just like, you know, like why, why am I doing this? But, you know, looking back now, if I, if I would have known what practice was when I was younger, I would have just done that. You know, I've seen people at, at my company come out of the program as, you know, 18, 19 years old and they're in jobs that, people at 22, 23 are struggling to get um, right. coming out of college. And not only that, they were taught how to deal with, with having a job. And, um, you know, I, I don't wanna sit here and bash college too much. I think there's certain majors that it makes sense for, but, you know, some of these people I see, they, they come out with a business degree, just a generic four-year degree. Yeah. You know, I don't wanna knock them, but it's like, you could have, you could have just jumped right into the work world. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here, here's what I've seen from our experience is that the person who is going to be, you know, highly capable of doing the types of jobs you're talking about at 22, 23 after college, they're highly capable of doing it at 18, 19. And it really comes down to like, do you want to, are you ready to start your professional life? If you're ready to start it, start it. Don't, don't treat college as this mandatory prerequisite that you, you have to go through. You don't. And, and that's true whether somebody does practice or not. Like as an individual, you can go and prove to a company that like, hey, I can give me an opportunity. I can create value for you. I, you just need to know how to pitch them the right way. Um, and I think the, the biggest issue with college is that we treat it as an assumption. And it's a crazy thing to treat as an assumption, given not just a financial investment of, you know, six, six figures on a pretty common, common basis, but you're, 
people on average are graduating. It takes them five to six years to graduate now. You are literally, you're just assuming that you have to spend that amount of money, that amount of time to, to end up having to do the same things that you would have to do at 18, 19, if you wanted to skip that stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting to see, you know, people in their early twenties getting up to the six figure mark, you know, with no college education. And, um, you know, like I said before, we, we've had multiple people come out of practice that have worked at PandaDoc. Um, in fact, the team that I just managed until the 1st of October, I think, what, three, four, four out of five people yeah. came from the Praxis program. And um, I've said this a million times before, but it just made my job feel easy. You know, yeah. there's no like, you know, formal education of going to school, but it's just like everyone knew what to do. Like everyone yeah. was like a sponge, was like willing to try new things, knew how to present themselves. And, you know, I think that's something that everyone should look into, whether you want to go to school first, you already done school. It's not like you have to graduate at 17, 18 and do practice right away. So for, right. for anyone who's, who's, you know, graduated and did go to school and still feel like you're not getting to where you need, um, that's something I would recommend too. It's awesome. Appreciate it, Andrew. Of course. So kind of along those lines, Cameron, um, I know that you had mentioned in a meeting earlier this year in, in one of the Praxis meetings that you guys were trying to develop like a clear value proposition so that, as you mentioned, when moms, cousins, uncles and aunts, they're all like, what are you doing? Um, yeah. There's like a clear response because this is a very serious and valuable program and people need to understand that it's a totally viable option for young yep. people today. Um, so I, I would like to dig into that a little bit more. How has that process been um, for you all there? Um, who sort of came up with it and, and just sort of what is the genesis of that and where is it at right now? Yeah, for sure. So this is actually something we've spent a good amount of time working on this this year. And, you know, there's still always, always room for improvement, but I feel like we've made a, a big, a big leap from from where we were this year. So um, right now, like, this is the, the positioning and framing challenge. And it's like, all right, whatever your product and service is, how, how are you describing it? to a prospect and how are they thinking about it? And, and not just who you're directly selling to, but like, what is, what is Praxis, not just to like an, an individual prospective participant, but what is Praxis to their family and the people they're telling about it? What is Praxis to like the media? Like, these are all things like we gotta keep getting better at in order to, you know, reach our potential as far as being able to reach as many Praxis quality individuals that we're excited to work with and stuff. So the, the historic kind of challenge for us has been, it's hard to categorize Praxis because um, it's, it's not a, it's not a, just a, another version of college or university. We're trying to be something in some way like entirely different but everyone's mental framework that they're working off of is like college so like that's the natural comparison to make and i think in our early days we we were scared to directly compare ourselves to college not not on the like we wanted to obviously be like, hey, this is something you can do other than college, but we didn't want our entire like value prop foundation based off of like an anti-college framing either. Because you, you want your product, you want your service to stand on its own feet. Um, so in the early days, we were primarily positioned as an apprenticeship program. And you know, at, at time, like we had apprenticeship program framing, 
And there was pros and cons to that. Cause it's like, all right, that gives me something tangible to work with. Like I'm going to get an apprenticeship out of this thing. But then there was a lot of work to educate people on what do we mean by apprenticeship? Cause you know, that has pretty um, like historic connotations. And I, there's some connotations with like more of like jobs in the trades and, and things like that. And that's, you know, that's not what we do. Um, so it's been a challenge for us and, you know, we've, we're always trying to improve it. So anyway, kind of speeding up to this year, where we're at right now, the, the biggest, the number one, like positioning of, of Praxis, it's first and foremost, this is a college alternative program. So we, we've got a lot, especially like this wouldn't have worked as well six, seven years ago when the company started, it's there's a lot of benefits now because there are more people than ever, like specifically looking for college alternatives. What am I going to do if I don't want to go to college? And we want to be, you know, kind of at the forefront of that. Um, and so that, that's the number one thing. And beyond that, you know, I, I specifically describe as like, this is a business and entrepreneurship program that is a college alternative. And so that's describing like, all right, the type of person at, you know, the age that we're kind of targeting people, if someone's intrigued by a business and entrepreneurship program to get their career started, there's a, there's a strong chance that they're going to be interested in Praxis. And we're real, like, we're trying to just baby step it of like, all right, college alternative. We've seen results of that. It makes, that gives people a, you know, category in their mind to place Praxis. And then we still have a lot of work to do to like kind of get at the more subtle and nitty gritty points of like, hey, our program's like highly selective. It's very intense. We're, you know, the, the boot camp itself is going to push you. We're going to, you know, help you start your career with tech startups and, and other growing businesses. There's still a lot underneath the surface to get across before someone's ready to purchase. Um, but as, as far as like at the top, uh, of what they're what they're seeing, you know, when they're first interacting with Praxis, it's college alternative, you know, a program that ends up with you hired at a great company if you put in the work. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I want to ask you a question that um, sometimes is is hard to answer because we all we all make a lot of mistakes in our career, and you know, it's how we learn, but. Can you tell us about a failure in your career and how you overcame that? Yeah, so I'll, I have a, a little more lighthearted answer to this one uh, or lighthearted now, given, given how everything ended up. So my, when I was interning for our founder before we started practice, I was in my senior year of college. It was in springtime. So like I was actively on the job market for that first job out of school. And I have found an organization called Foundation for Economic Education. They're a education uh, nonprofit based in Atlanta. And they, you know, they held, at that time, they held a bunch of uh, summer seminars for high school and college students on mostly like economics and philosophy, et cetera. Um, I was a big fan of them. And they, they were hiring for like an entry level uh, called a development associate. So pretty much working on their fundraising team, um, which kind of like an entry level sales position to, to some degree, more, more of like a sales operations role almost. Um, so I interviewed with them, went well, they invited me to come help them out at a donor event they were running down in Florida, which I was really excited to do. And just a, a very small insight there. I had no idea if they were planning on paying me for the event or like, you know, helping me with travel, but I, I didn't dare ask them because like, all right, this is an opportunity. This is my chance to go prove to them they should hire me. So, and I think you should take that mindset if you're in that kind of situation. So anyway, long story short, I'm at the event and my potential supervisor asked me to go run down to the uh, FedEx 
uh, store a couple couple blocks away and go print copies out of like the program or, or something like that. And he gave me his credit card to go, you know, pay for it. Um, so I go down, I'm in FedEx, I get the copies made, I pay for them. I walk back to the hotel, I come back up, deliver the copies. And as I'm walking up, I realize I don't have the credit card on me. And I'm like freaking out. Cause that, that's like the stupid, silly mistake. That's a really big deal. And it's like, hey, you get one impression and like, you don't want your impression to be like, this kid just lost my credit card. Like all you had to do was walk two blocks and, and back. Like, if you can't do that, then what can I do with you? Um, so I spent the whole time, like I spent the first five, 10 minutes after realizing that just like, I went back and traced my steps as quickly as I could, pretty much gave myself 10 minutes, couldn't find it. And that's when I like fessed up and be like, hey, this happened. I'm going to go back to the store and search in more detail, et cetera, et cetera. Like overly apologetic, just, you know, laying myself at the feet of, of this guy. Um, I eventually, so this is a crazy part of it. On my second time, like tracing my steps back, all I went back to the store and I like covered every inch of the store. I was like, it has to be somewhere. I had given up hope. I was walking out of the store, walking back on the side of the street. And I'm like actively looking down at my feet and everything. And this homeless person looks up at me and goes, hey, are you looking for this? And he literally is, uh, is uh, holding the credit card. And I'm like, uh, yes, that's amazing. And he gave it to me. I was like, dude, you just saved my life here. Um, so I gave him some money and then I went back, you know, what, what's done is done at that point. It almost didn't matter if I found it or not, because like the mistake of losing it was made. So actually who I, the founder, uh, Isaac, the founder of Praxis, who I was interning for at the time, like a week later, he got a call from the, you know, my future supervisor. And he's like, Hey, like it went pretty well with Cameron, but you know, he lost the credit card. Like, does he have a habit of, you know, not having a great attention to detail and stuff? And I was like, oh my gosh, no, like that's never happened before, blah, blah, blah. So like, I'm just very thankful for that. But like, that's a, that's a failure. And if I didn't have the track record, like if, if they didn't personally know Isaac, who I was working for to give me that reference, there's a pretty good chance. Like I would not have, I've not been hired for that. And so now I'm like super, super paranoid about any of that type of stuff ever. I've been scarred for life. About credit yeah. cards? Yeah. Uh, losing anything. I, I can't do it. Wow, that's so stressful. I felt stressed for you. Yeah, I felt stressful just story. listening to that story. I was like, yeah. oh God, I got to know what happened here. Yeah. <laughs> like my heart but rate is up. I... I can't remember, like, I, I think I just gave the person on the street, like, whatever amount of money I had, I was just, like, so thankful that I was, like, how did, how is this happening right now? It was wild. So, if we asked that guy if he made a mistake in his career, we'd probably be giving that credit card back. He could have <laughs> balled out. I mean, he, he ended up not doing too shabby, yeah, um, but, yeah, we, we all had a good day after that. That's good. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's that's an excellent story. And I feel but everyone's got a moment like that, especially oh. at the beginning of your career when you are kind of young and stupid. It's like yeah. you're going like, you're going to mess. You're going to do stupid stuff like that multiple yeah. times. Yeah, Andrew likes to say to his to his, well, I guess, ex. <laughs> what are we called? Your ex? My, my ex squad. X squad because <laughs> he, he was our manager as he mentioned um but he Brandy I the, thought you were like about to tell a story about like an ex-girlfriend I'm like this is awkward all right <laughs> but, you, but you were gonna roll with it <laughs> I mean I was gonna see where it was gonna go yeah 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 no um <laughs> that, that would be funny I, I I don't know if I would ever do something like that I probably would 
But oh, anyway, <laughs> so um, one of the first things Andrew told me when I got hired at PandaDoc was, please mess up. He was like, yeah. mess up right now, because I'll think you're not human if you don't mess up. And right. like, we're never going to figure out how you work best. Like, we're just going to need it to happen. So just go make it happen. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I mean, especially in sales, like you have, if you're good, that means you experiment a lot. And you, and you figure out what works and what doesn't. And the only way to do that is, is by trying new things out. And like, that's probably, that's a great, great thing to tell a new employee, especially like entry, like brand new to sales and everything. Like just, just try stuff and it's, it's going to mess, you know, you're going to mess up, but you're going to learn from it. Yeah. And it, and it sets a mindset, at least for me, Andrew, it's set a mindset of like, that's okay to experiment and to fail and to figure out what to do when you do fail because you've never done this before and so then like moving forward when I wasn't so new it was like oh I made a mistake but I wouldn't spend a ton of time beating myself up about it because that's how I started the whole thing was with that mindset yeah I think I have to credit that I had somebody say to me once uh, show me someone who doesn't make mistakes and I'll show you someone who's not trying and that was a while ago and that's still something that resonates with me and um you know if you want to try something like i guess an extreme example would be like pole vaulting right you can't just go and do it you know you have to you're gonna mess up so you're either gonna mess up and do it right or you don't do it at all so when you're building your career do you want to build a career or do you want to sit back and not mess up and just be stagnant so i'm glad that worked for you brandy yeah. And I, I think the messier, like the first three to five or even 10 years of your career are the, the better, because you're going to learn more about like from an individual perspective, like you're going to learn more about what you actually want to do. And more importantly, like what you don't want to do. If, if you're trying all different types of jobs and roles out and everything, if you happen to find something, you're just like perfect fit for, and like, man, this is just what I should be doing earlier than, than most people do. Great. But the default should be, Hey, over the first five to 10 years of my career, like I should have three, four or five different, like completely different types of jobs that I do. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that that's, that's the way to find out what you want to do because, you know, things change so fast, especially in the industry we're in and you know, you, you can like a job for a little bit. You can get bored of it. You can work at a company and, you know, see what other people do in a different role and, and, and try that. But it all goes back to learning and you can't do that without mistakes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that leads us to um, the last question. I'd love to hear what is one thing that someone can do today right now to get better at sales you know could be soft skill could be sales cold calling whatever you think start selling you just got to do it i i've seen i've seen people that are they look like a fish out of water when they get started but if you just have the courage to keep going and and deal with you know not just like the external rejection of somebody saying no to you but the internal rejection of like, I, I'm hearing myself talk and I feel like I suck at sales and it can be true. And if you're able to push through that, then I I think anybody can become above average at sales. Yeah. I agree. I, yeah. We had a former manager, my company, uh, he was a SDR manager. And when I first started, I asked him, what can I do to get better now? And he said, don't be afraid to get on the phone in front of people. He said, don't go in the call booth. Don't go upstairs, downstairs, just call in front of people. And at first I was like, well, how can I do that? If like, I'm not going to be comfortable doing that. And then you quickly learn, you got to jump in the swim. And as you're doing it, it just forces you to get better. So um, yeah. there's no, there's no easy way to get better like you you know you got to take the stairs yeah. any like anything if someone's nervous about doing sales 
and you give them like an assign like any type of prep work to do i think you're harming that person more than just be like hop on the phone and just get through you know 100 phone calls and you know give them give them the crappy leads and everything and you know just in, i think it's even good to tell people up front like these leads aren't worth much just get get through these and if you get something that's awesome but what you're doing right now is literally just getting reps in. That's all that matters. And just take take the pressure off of them in in terms of like outcomes and stuff. But you just you just gotta get on the phone or you know, you gotta get in front of people and talk. Yeah. Definitely. Hundred percent. Well, Cameron, thank you so much for taking the time out to come on today and sharing your wisdom and your credit card story <laughs> which is still wisdom <laughs> so yeah, we appreciate coming on man good insight i had a i had a blast guys <laughs>